urgency. I do. This. Yes. Senator Booker. Thank you. Senator Booker. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I just want to say about uh, the DACA uh, issue going on right now, that to me this is a, a very profound moral issue in our country. Um, it's a moral issue because, as you know, many of these children do not have uh, even memories of their home country. And now in our nation they're doing yeah. things that are extraordinary. In my state we have DACA uh, recipients, dreamers who are servants in the military. We have dreamers who are first responders. We have dreamers who are entrepreneurs. Uh, one young lady sat in my office and employs hundreds and hundreds of people. And I'm sure you're aware, because you've probably met with these people, correct? You've met with dreamers, yes? I have not met with uh, DACA recipients as Secretary of Homeland Security, no, sir. Have you met with them before, dreamers before? I, not as self-identified, no. So, so then for your knowledge, a lot of these folks are now hanging, not only in the balance of waiting for policy, but it's an, a, a, a grievous anxiety. Um, it's undermining their life and their well-being and their ability to serve. Um, this moment for them, these weeks and weeks of waiting, on something where 80% of, of Americans agree, Republicans and Democrats agree, that we should find a way for these folks to stay in this country. Uh, what is happening to them right now is unacceptable treatment uh, to people who are fellow Americans, but for uh, the, the documentation. I want to just turn, though, uh, and you ought to forgive me, uh, listening to the testimony has uh, changed my line of questioning a bit. Um, because this is very personal to me. Uh, I sit here right now because when good white people in this country heard bigotry or hatred, they stood up. Mo moving into my home community, we were denied housing because of the color of our skin. And there was white Americans from Bergen County who banded together to fight against racism, to fight against hate speech, to fight against people who had broad brush generalities about people based upon their ethnicity, based upon their origin, based upon their religion. What went on in the White House, what went on in the Oval Office, is profoundly disturbing to me. And I'll tell you this, I heard about it when I was in Puerto Rico, when it happened. And here I was there, trying to help a community dealing with <laughs> savage challenges. I can't tell you how many Puerto Ricans brought up that conversation in the White House. I returned to Atlanta to go to the King Center Awards, and from the greatest luminaries from the Civil Rights Movement down to average Americans, this was on their mind. I returned to Newark, New Jersey, and I talked to African Americans from Africa. I talked to Central American Americans. I talked to regular Newarkers, and this was top on their mind. Yesterday, I talked to the ambassador from Haiti. And to see all that they're doing as a result of this conversation. Now, I've been in the Oval Office many times. And when the commander in chief speaks, I listened. I don't have amnesia on conversations I had in the Oval Office going back months and months and months. And I've had individual meetings with the president. And I've had group conversations where there was, as you said, cross-talk. And why, why is this so important? Why is this so disturbing for me? Why am I, frankly, seething with anger? We, we have this incredible nation where we have been taught that it does not matter where you're from. It doesn't matter your color, your race, or religion. It's about the content of your character. It's about your values and your ideals. And yet we have a language that from Dick Durbin to Lindsey Graham, they seem to have a much better recollection of what went on. You're under oath. You and others in that room that suddenly cannot remember. It was Martin Luther King that said, there's nothing in this world more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. And so here we are in the United States of America. And we have a history that is beautiful and grand and also ugly. Where from this nation to others, we know what happens when people sit by and are bystanders and say nothing. When Oval Office rhetoric sounds like social engineering, 
We know from a human history the dangers of that. Our greatest, our greatest heroes in this country spoke out about people who have convenient amnesia or who are bystanders. King said, a man dies when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. A man dies when he refuses to take a stand. Elie Wiesel says, we must take side. Neutral neutrality helps the oppressor. Never the victim. Silent encourages a tormentor. Never the tormented. Gandhi said, silence becomes cowardice. Cowardice. When, we occasion, when the occasion demands speaking out like Lindsey Graham did, and acting accordingly. This idea that the commander of chief of this country could with broad brushes talk about certain nations and thus cast a shadow over the millions of Americans who are from those communities. And that you could even say in your testimony the Norwegians were, were preferenced by him because they're so hardworking. I, I didn't. I, excuse me, let me finish. Happy to. Let me just draw a connection of why that matters. I'm sure you remember the six words from our president, the six words that he said after Charleston, Virginia, last summer. People marching with tiki torches and hate when he said there are very fine people on both sides. Very fine people on both sides. When the commander-in-chief speaks or refuses to speak, those words just don't dissipate like mist in the air. They fester. They become poison. They give license to bigotry and hate in our country. I know you're aware of a 2017 GAO report that found, and I quote, out of the 85 violent extremist incidents that resulted in deaths in September 12, 2001, Far right-wing violent extremist groups were responsible for 73%. When I go through the black belt in the South, when I'm in Atlanta, black churches in Newark, they're concerned about jihadist Islamic terrorism. We watched the Twin Towers from Newark go down. But since 9-11, 85 violent incidents, 73%. We're with people that hold bigoted, hateful ideas about minorities. One American killed in Charleston, Virginia, and dozens injured. Nine Americans killed in a shirt shooting in Charleston, South Carolina, by a white supremacist. An American killed and another wounded in Kansas after a white supremacist targeted them for their ethnicity, saying, get out of my country. Six, six Americans killed and four others wounded in Wisconsin, where white supremacists targeted individuals for their religion. The commander-in-chief, in an Oval Office meeting, referring to people from African countries and Haitians with the most vile and vulgar language. That language festers. When ignorance and bigotry is allied with power, it is a dangerous force in our country. Your silence and your amnesia is complicity. Right now in our nation, we have a problem. I don't know if 73% of your time is spent on white supremacist hate groups. I don't know if 73% of your time is spent concerned about the people in fear in communities in this country, Sikh Americans, Muslim Americans, black Americans. The fact pattern is clear of the threats in this country. I hurt. When Dick Durbin called me, I had tears of rage when I heard about this experience in that meeting. And for you not to feel that hurt and that pain and to dismiss some of the questions of my colleagues, saying I've already answered that line of questions when tens of millions of Americans are hurting right now because of what they're worried about what happened in the White House. That's unacceptable to me. There are threats in this country. People plotting. I receive enough death threats to know the reality. Kamala receives enough death threats to know the reality. Maisie receives enough death threats to know the reality. And I've got a president of the United States whose office I respect, who talks about the country's origins of my fellow citizens in the most despicable of manner. You don't remember. You can't remember the words of your commander-in-chief.
I find that unacceptable. Mr. Chairman, I'm grateful to be on this committee. I'm more than ever today happy I am here. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Graham. Sir, could I just respond, if you don't mind, after no. that? No, wait, I would just like to say wait, that... Wait, uh, wait, Senator Graham. Go ahead and respond. Would, would that be okay? Yeah. yeah. I would just like to say I, I do clearly, and I want to be clear on this, abhor violence in all of its forms. I couldn't agree with you more that the Department of Homeland Security has a duty to stop and prevent violence in all of its forms. Our preventing terrorism programs have been reassessed and relooked at just this year to ensure that we actually are going after the threats to include white supremacy, not just to focus on what was focused on in years past. So just, just to, I would just like to say that to you. I share your passion. It's unacceptable. It can't be tolerated in the United States. Under the authorities that I have at the Department of Homeland Security, violence in any form will not be tolerated. Senator Graham. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, welcome, Senator Booker. I'm glad you're here, too. Uh, so do you agree with me that the threats to the nation are, are pretty severe, and if we shut down the government, that'd be a bad idea? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, does the president intend?